It's better off. No, it isn't. Um, there'd been no rain in the Potterstrom district for many months, and so the ground was very hard that morning, and the picks and shovels of the Kaffirs rang on the gravel by the side of the mud hut that had been used as a courthouse. I was a boy then. It was at a time when the Transvaal was divided into four separate republics, and Potterstrom, which was a small village, was the capital of the Southern Republic. For several days, there'd been much activity in the courthouse. From distant parts, the farmers had come to attend the trial of Chart von Rendsburg. Only a few could get inside the courthouse. The rest watched at the door, crowding forward eagerly after each witness had stepped down from the stand. Those inside told them what evidence had been given. Naturally, there was much excitement over these court proceedings, and in Potterstrom, people talked of little else but the Transvaal's first murder trial. The whole thing started when Henri Thoron was found beside the borehole on his farm. He'd been pumping water for his cattle. One Rousseau, a neighbour of Henri Thoron's, passing by on his ox wagon, saw a man lying next to the pump handle. Thus it was that Francina Thoron saw her husband arrive home in a stranger's ox wagon with a piece of buck sail pulled over his body and a martini bullet in his heart. Sure. The Landros men came from Potterstrom and proceeded to investigate the murder, spending much of their time, as Landros men always do, in trying to frighten the wrong people into confessing. But afterwards, they got their information. They say there was a large crowd at the funeral of Andres Theron, which took place at the foot of a copy on the far end of his farm. They came, the women in black clothes and the men in their Sunday hats, and in that sad procession that would slowly, wound slowly over the felt, following the wagon with the coffin on it, there were also two Landrost's men. Among the mourners was the dead man's cousin, Chart from Rendsburg. He said a few simple words about the tragic way in which Andres Theron had died, adding that no man knew when his hour has come. He then spoke a brief message of comfort to the widow, Francina, and offered up a prayer for the dead man's soul. The last notes of the Boer hymn had died on the felt, and the crowd had already begun to move away from the graveside when one of the Landros men put his hand on Chart from Rendsburg's shoulder with an officer of the law on each side of him and fetters on his wrists, Chart von Rendsburg led the procession down the stony road. The prisoner had turned very pale, but they all noticed that his head was erect and he stepped firm. When he walked to the blue gum trees on the other side of the hill where the government Cape Cod waited. A month later, the trial commenced in Potterstrom. André Theron's widow, Francina, was a slenderly built woman, still in her early twenties. She'd been very pretty at the time, with light-hearted ways and a merry laugh. But the shock of her husband's death had changed her in an hour. She did not weep when Rousseau, who had a good heart but blunt ways, informed her that he had found her husband lying dead on the felt. I was lucky, Rousseau said, to have found him before the vultures did. Where is he? Francine asked. On my wagon, Rousseau answered. Under the first buck sale you come to, next to the sack of potatoes. In some respect, Rousseau did not have what you would talk a real what you would call a real delicacy of feeling. But he possessed a somber thing of the felt, which told him that he must not follow Francina to the wagon, because it was right that at her first meeting with her dead husband, a wife should be alone. Francina was at the wagon a long time. When she came back, she was sadly changed. The colour had left her cheeks and her lips. Her mouth sagged at the corners, but in her tearless eyes, there was a lost and hopeless look, a dreadful desolation that frightened Rousseau when he saw it, so that he made no effort to comfort her. It was the same with the women who came to console Francina. 
If a woman wanted to take Francina in her arms so that she could weep on her bosom, there was that look in her eyes that spoke of a sorrow that must be for always. You can't do much if all you have to offer a widow is human sympathy, and she looks back at you with wide eyes that seem to want nothing more from this world or the world to come. You get uneasy then and feel that you have no right to trespass on that sort of sorrow. That was what happened to the women who knew Francina. They were kind to her in little ways. When the time came for the murder trial, and it seemed likely that Francina might be called as a witness, a woman accompanied her to Potterstrom and stayed with her there. But even to this woman, in her grief, Francina remained a stranger. In fact, this woman <coughs> always said afterwards that during all the time she was with her, Francina spoke to her only once. And that was when they were at the Moy River, which flows through Potterstrom. And Francina said how pretty the yellow flowers grew on the banks of the river. So the trial began. Every morning at nine o'clock, Chart von Rensburg was led from the jail to the courthouse with the mud walls. There were always many people standing around to see him pass. I saw him quite often. The impression I get when I look back to that time is that Chart von Rensburg was a broad-shouldered man of about 30, taller than the guards who escorted him, and rather good-looking. I remember the way he walked, with his head up, and his hat on a slant, and his wrists close together in front of him. On each side of him was a burger with a bandolier and a rifle. The Nandros looked important, as Nandros should look at his murder trial. The juryman also looked very dignified, but the most pompous of all was Rousseau. Over and over again, to anybody who would listen, he told the story of how he discovered the body before the vultures did. He told everybody just what evidence he was going to give and what theories he was going to put forward as to how the murder was committed. He even brought his ox wagon along to the courthouse and drew it up in the sidewalk so that the Landrost and the jurymen had difficulty in getting in at the door. He said he was willing to demonstrate to the court just at what pace he drove the body from the bore hole to Andre Storon's house. Afterwards, Rousseau was the most disappointed man I ever saw. For he was only kept in the witness box for about five minutes, and they wouldn't listen to any of his theories. On the other hand, the Kaffir, who chart from Rendsburg arguing with the deceased in front of the bore hole, gave evidence for over three hours. And another Kaffir, who heard a shot and thought he saw Chart von Rensburg running down the road with a gun, was in the witness box for the best part of a day. What do you think of this for a piece of nonsense? Rousseau asked of a group standing about the courthouse. I am a white man. I have borne arms for the Transvaal in three Kaffir wars, and I'm only in the witness box for five minutes when they tell me to step down and move my ox wagon away from the door. And yet, a raw Kaffir, who can't even sign his name, but has got to put a cross at the foot of the things he has said, this raw Kaffir is allowed to stand there, wasting the time of the court for 10 hours on end. What's more, Rousseau went on, Chart von Rensburg's lawyer never once cross-questioned me or called me a liar whereas he spent half a day in calling their Kaffir names, doesn't that lawyer think that my evidence is of any value to the court? Rousseau said a lot more things like that. Some of the burghers laughed at his remarks, but others took him seriously and agreed with him and said it was a shame that such things should be allowed and that it all proved that the president did not have the interests of the nation at heart. Heard that before. You can see from this that it must have been a difficult task to govern the Transvaal in those days. The case lasted almost a week. What with all the witnesses and the long speeches made by the prosecution and the defence? Also, the Landros said a great many learned things about Roman Dutch law. During all this time, Francina sat in court with that same unearthly look in her eyes. They say that she never once wept. Even when the doctor, a Hollander, explained how he cut open Andres Duron's body and found that the bullet had gone through the heart, 
The expression on Francina's face did not change. People who knew her grew anxious about her state. They said it was impossible for her to continue in this way, and that if she did not break down and weep, she could not go on living much longer. Anyway, Francina was not called as a witness. Perhaps they felt that there was nothing of importance that she could say. So the days passed. And Rousseau was still complaining about the unfair way he'd been treated in the witness box when Charlton Rainsburg, his hat tilted over the eye and his wrists close together in front of him, strode into the courthouse for the last time. The Landros looked less important on that morning and the jurymen did not seem very happy, but they were not the kind of men to shirk the duty they had sworn to carry out. Chart von Rendsburg was asked if he had anything to say before sentence was passed on him. Yes, I am guilty, he answered. I shot on this throne. His voice was steady, and he, as he spoke, he twirled the brim of his hat slowly round and round between his fingers. And that was how it came about that early one winter's morning, a number of Kaffirs were swinging their picks into the hard gravel, digging a hole by the sides of the courthouse. A small group had gathered at the courthouse. Among the spectators was Francina Teron, looking very frail and slender in her widow's dress. When the grave was deep enough, a roughly constructed coffin was lifted out of a cart that bore, painted on its side, the arms of the Republic. The grave was filled in. The newly made mound of gravel and the red earth was patted smooth with the shovels. Then, for the first time since her husband's death, Francina wept. She flung herself at full length on the mound and trailed her fingers through the pebbles and fresh earth, and calling out tender and passionate endearments, Francina sobbed noisily on the grave of her lover.